Library and the home of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. My name is Tom Pansella with MIMH. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. I'll introduce our speaker to you in just a moment. I'd like to welcome back those of you who have joined us before. For those of you who are new to this, this format of presentation, welcome. We're glad, you, glad you're here today. We've tinkered with the screen layout a little bit. You're used to seeing the chat window uh, right underneath the video window sometimes. Now you'll see it over on the right column. Still feel free to use that chat box to type any questions or other feedback to us. We'll ask questions on your behalf at the end of the presentation time today, but please feel free to submit them at any time during the presentation. The box immediately underneath the video window, you'll see our live transcription going for you. So if you'd like to read along and have trouble hearing what's going on, you can read along with what's going on, and we're glad to have that service provided for you as well. Scrolling down a little bit, you'll see how you can pop up the speaker slides in a separate window as a PDF file if you like. You'll also see a link to the KUTO website, kudo.org, where Elizabeth is from. You'll also see a links to purchase CEUs if you're interested in that, as well as links to our Spring Training Institute, which we plan on behalf of the Missouri Department of Mental Health. And Elizabeth's going to be part of that program, joining our cadre, a, a large cadre of speakers for that event. So if you're anywhere near the Missouri area at the end of May, the week following Memorial Day, please take a look at that website for that training. So now I'd like to introduce once again Elizabeth McCulloch. She's joined us before. We're, we're glad to have her back Thank with you. us today. She's the project coordinator of the Eastern Region Suicide Prevention Resource Center, and she's been working in the field of suicide, of youth suicide prevention since 1994. She, the KUDO's mission that we referred to earlier is to prevent suicide and foster the emotional well-being of youth. They prepare teens with the skills, confidence, and courage to help their peers and themselves cope before, during, and after crises. Ms. McCulloch's training certifications include Living Work Safe Talk, the Suicide Alertness for Everyone, and the ASSIST, the Applied Suicide Intervention Training Community Education Programs, the QRP, the Question Refer per Persuade Suicide Prevention, the Screening for Mental Health Signs of Suicide Youth Prevention Program, the Lifeline Suicide Awareness and Responsiveness Program, Mental Health First Aid, and CALM, Counseling on Access to Lethal Means, which we'll be discussing today. She is a graduate of the Prevent Violence and Injury Prevention Institute. She served as a member of the Missouri Suicide Prevention Advisory Committee, and she supervises the Eastern Region Suicide Prevention Resource Center on behalf of the Missouri Department of Mental Health. So I don't think there's questions of qualifications. <laughs> Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you for being here today to learn a little bit more about CALM, Council on Access to Lethal Means. Uh, in Missouri, suicide is the tenth leading cause of death across the lifespan, and it's the third leading cause of death for young people between the ages of 15 to 24. We know that many attempters of suicide are as ambivalent about their death as they are about their life. And preventing suicides can be a very complex puzzle of putting the pieces together to help someone identify or find reasons for living um, at the same time as they're struggling with an overwhelming feeling of not wanting to live any longer. And this puzzle requires all of us to have skills and competence in the areas of prevention as well as um, recognizing opportunities to reduce access to lethal means. One piece of this puzzle is, as I just mentioned, reducing the access to lethal means, particularly prescription medications and firearms. Counseling on Access to Lethal Means, or CALM, is a workshop that's been designed to bring greater awareness to how restricting lethal means can be effective, and it provides a, pre a framework of how to create greater safety for those who may be at risk for suicide. A little bit of background about the presentation today. It was developed in the mid-2000s by Elaine Frank and several of her colleagues at the Injury Prevention Center at Children's Hospital at Dar Dartmouth. And it was first intended to be utilized by first responders or emergency departments when they were releasing people who had been at, risk, at high risk for suicide or had made a lethal attempt at suicide and were returning to their homes and workplaces as a way to increase and enhance the safety around that individual. Ms. Frank um, collaborated with Dr. Catherine Barbie from the uh, Means Matter Project at the Harvard Injury Control Research Center, and much of this work has been underwritten by the Suicide Prevention Partnership and the Guten Family Foundation. CALM is also listed on the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, American Foundation for, um, American, excuse me, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Best Practice Registry in Section 3. So what is CALM? 
COM is what we consider to be an add-on component. It's not a standalone suicide prevention training or workshop. It's comprised of multiple training elements that are designed around adult learning uh, activities. There are uh, visual activities, there is lecture, there is interaction, there's a video component, and then there are also case studies and role plays that are included in the CALM training. It's a specific piece that can be utilized by counselors or uh, practitioners during their conversations with people who may be struggling with thoughts of suicide as a manner to help bring to light that uh, suicide can be prevented by uh, recognizing not only warning signs and um, some symptomology, but by minimizing the access to lethal means that an individual might have. It also reinforces the public health uh, model of um, preventing suicide and that doing so can be generally accomplished by anyone in the suicidal person's environment that might come in contact with them. Um, the one thing to be mindful of is that uh, CALM by no way is considered a risk assessment for suicide, nor is it considered to be a lethality assessment for suicide. And what I'm going to be spending some time this afternoon with you is just going over the program, making you a little more aware of the training components, and to help you understand how adding CALM to your toolbox could help uh, you in identifying and helping clients who may be at risk for suicide, but can also bring you some confidence and um, self-assuredness in knowing that what you're doing is following best practice. So what are we talking about? Just a little bit of background and information with regard to some of the language that we use when we're talking about means restriction. The first piece, uh, the first word that I want to talk about is means. What, what is means? And that's the actual instrument or tool that's used to inflict self-destructive behaviors. And that can be uh, medication, poison, firearm, knives, um, ropes, for, or ligatures. Method refers to the action or the technique by which that means, excuse me, um, is utilized. So that could be um, asphyxiation, overdose, um, jumping, gunshot wound. When we talk about restricting means, we're talking about the techniques, policies, and procedures that are designed to reduce access or availability to means and methods of deliberate self-harm. So when we can better understand what the words mean, it's going to help us understand why means restriction is such an important component of suicide prevention. A couple of points I wanted to cover with you. It's been demonstrated that it's an effective intervention. Um, many people who are suicidal that have made an attempt, a non-lethal attempt at suicide, never make another attempt. So they don't switch their means. They don't um, uh, substitute uh, one method for another method. Another piece that's an important to keep in mind is that goal six of the newly released 2012 National Strategy for Suicide Prevention reads, promote efforts to reduce access to lethal means of suicide among individuals with identified risk. And the very first objective underneath that goal is encourage routine assessing for access to lethal means. Means restriction is also cited in our state, Missouri State Suicide Plan for Prevention, as um, a, a, a very strong piece that's needed to be considered. The next thing that we need to uh, keep in mind when we're talking about means restriction is the ambivalence of people who are struggling with thoughts of suicide. Their willingness to live is compromised to the same degree that their willingness to die is strong. So if we can create more safety and more opportunities to use that ambivalence more to the life side than the death side, we have a better opportunity to prevent that suicide death from occurring. The other piece that's important to keep in mind is the impulsivity of suicide, and we'll get to that um, in just a moment. But um, suicide is, is typically um, highly impulsive, particularly when we're looking at younger populations um, under 24. So the question becomes not why means restrict Restri restriction, but why not? So the objectives of CALM are, are straightforward, and they have to do with increasing knowledge and increasing skill and confidence when talking to someone about access to lethal means and in identifying those people who are at greater risk for um, attempting suicide. The training agenda is very straightforward. It can be delivered in either 90 minutes 
or an hour to, excuse me, to two and a half hours. Um, ideally, the 90 minute is, is just the bare bones presentation. A two hour presentation would be good, but enable to um, cover all of the material, uh, include meaningful conversation and dialogue, really participate in the case studies and in the role plays, I would really encourage at least two and a half hours for this um, program. There are five primary components to the COM training. Uh, identifying the scope of the problem, introduction to firearms and their operation, negotiation of res means restriction. There's a video component of conducting a firearms assessment. As I mentioned a moment ago, case study and role play is very critical in developing competence and comfort in utilizing COM. We include a question and answer period, and then again, um, evaluation and feedback with regard to participant um, use of COM and the reflection on the training itself. Key points when we're looking at COM as a, a, as a program, it's really identified as um, helping people recognize that removal of all lethal means from the home or work environment is critical. Not just safeguarding them, locking them away, but making sure that access is minimal, if at all. It's also important within this framework of CALM to help people recognize that just because someone might not know in your mind or your opinion where, act, where a lethal means, a method of lethal means might be, doesn't mean that they don't know about it. Um, I, I reflect specifically on um, situations where young people uh, know that there are firearms in the home, but parents might believe that they have them safely stored or there's no ammunition. What we know about lethal means is um, having that access directly impacts the probability that someone might utilize that tool or that means in a suicide attempt. Um, it's important to also recognize that securing lethal means affords only temporary safety. Um, people, while they might not substitute a means, they might very likely consider other means. So if um, a firearm may be in the home and it's removed, then the next step is we need to look at what's the next lethal means within that, that home or, or work environment. Um, I'm certainly not uh, proposing that uh, firearms or medications uh, be banned, but I am encouraging people to recognize that um, there, there's a pecking order when it comes to lethality in means, and we just need to be aware that that um, pecking order is present. Um, it's also not unusual for people to have access to lethal means that we don't know about, whether that's prescription or uh, illegal drugs, whether it's having access to the automobile, to the car, um, or just having a nearby high structure that they might choose to jump from. The last piece is that we need to focus um, on risk of suicide and the need for risk reduction. Um, we're not focusing only on limiting or um, eliminating suicidal behaviors, but we're talking about really ramping up our ability to recognize that um, the risk for suicide is present and we need to be um, familiar with what some options for reducing that risk might be. So before we move on, I want to just cover a couple of, um, of key facts. Um, there needs to be a foundation of suicide prevention present um, before someone moves on to participating in the CALM training. Um, warning signs, risk and protective factors, resources, um, having a confidence in asking those questions, um, are you having thoughts of suicide, do you have a plan, um, is necessary before um, trying to do any sort of counseling with regard to access to lethal means. We also need to be familiar that uh, mental health concerns abound everywhere and that research suggests that 90% of the people that die by suicide have struggled with one or more mental health concerns. We also know that mental health concerns many times go un or underdiagnosed or they're not ad adequately treated or are not explained well to the person struggling with that mental health concern or their families. We also know that uh, from research, 90% of the people that have made a non-lethal attempt at suicide do not go on to die by suicide. So in explaining that, that, that moment of 
making a highly lethal attempt to end their life um, becomes a moment of clarity for them. Um, many survivors of their attempt will say that as soon as they initiated their method, they realized that they had made a horrible mistake and um, would have done anything that they could to have never taken that, that step, that handful of pills, whatever it might be. This last piece is we know intervention works. 95% of the people that were prevented from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge did not die by suicide. Um, they were able to be connected with the resources and the help that they needed to work through the, the circumstance that was causing their suicidal ideations. And they were also able to get the treatment and the help that they needed to manage or quell their mental health concerns. So I want to just take a couple of minutes to look at some of the different training components that comprise the CALM workshop. So the, the first step is um, identifying the scope of the problem. And CALM is based in this hypothesis, very simple. Um, if we make highly lethal access, if we, make, if we reduce access to lethal means by making them less accessible, we are going to assume that we're either going to be able to reduce suicide attempts or we'll be able to delay suicide attempts to a point where um, intervention can occur and help can be provided. Or that individual, if we're not able to dissuade them from their thoughts of suicide, may attempt suicide with a less lethal means, which gives us the opportunity, again, to connect them to help either through um, first responders or additional treatment and diagnosis. So the question becomes, where do we begin? Which of um, these five elements are we going to focus on to identify where we need to begin our means restriction education, as well as utilizing that in a clinical situation? Well, I would suggest that we can't prioritize any one of these five elements, frequency, lethality, impulsivity, availability, or feasibility. We need to look at them all because each one of them contributes a different perspective when we're looking at means restriction. And this is where we're very lucky that we can turn to data and research to help guide us in identifying where the best places to start with means restriction might be. So with regard to frequency, we can look at, at this slide that shows the five leading causes of death across the lifespan. And we can definitely see that across the board, suicide impacts people of all ages. If we spend only our time focused on the 25 to 34-year-old segment, where suicide is the second leading cause of death, we would miss opportunities to work with um, younger populations as well as older populations. So um, we can't only look at frequency. We can't only identify those people that are dying more frequently um, by suicide. We need to um, look at um, other pieces as well. So looking at the lethality, um, how are people dying by suicide, we can look at this in a couple of different ways. And I have um, four different graphs that we're going to look at side by side. This first one has to do with all ages. And the blue section um, has to do with firearms. And we know that over 50% of all completed suicides are done so with a firearm. The next largest category has to do with suffocation. Then we have poisoning. And um, the purple sliver is that catch-all of others. It could be autocide. It could be drug overdoses. Um, it could be whatever accidental death um, could be identified. But when we begin to drill this down and look at different age categories, we see that those percentages, those ratios, don't necessarily change that much from age group to age group. So um, 24 and under, we see that there's a, a similar relationship to firearms as with all ages. Um, a greater number of young people um, use, utilize suffocation as a means. Um, and again, those, those other two categories of poisoning and other are, are much smaller. When we look at that middle age or the adult population, 25 to 64, again, we see that, that the slices of the pie are very similar. Um, over 50%, about f uh, between 35 between 30 and 35 percent suffocation. We see a larger segment of poisoning, um, but again, that smaller piece of the other. And the last graph that I want to share with you has to do with over the age of 65. And while 
Suicide is a leading cause of death across the lifespan. It is a tremendous cause of death for um, our elderly population. Um, over 65, um, you can see that almost 80%, uh, over 80% of the suicides were completed with a firearm. Um, and then the resulting ratios of the other manners of death as well. So we need to consider um, lethality as well as frequency when we're looking at means restriction. The next piece that, that we need to talk about is impulsivity. And suicide is, is a relatively impulsive act. Um, while it may be uh, well thought out and well planned, actually taking that step to end someone's life um, it happens in a very short window of time. Uh, we know that 24% uh, of people surveyed said that it took them less than five minutes to make that decision to end their life. And we know that people, 47% um, said that it was under an hour. So we're looking at a short window of time. Um, and when we look at that window of time compared to the lethality of the method that's chosen, it really ramps up the need to be responsive to uh, what can be done to create greater safety around that person. I'm a visual, so I really prefer to look at this in, in more of a graph um, picture because it, it makes a little more sense. So that you can see in this section, um, under five minutes to under an hour is, again, that um, over 50%. So we know that people struggle with thoughts of suicide, sometimes um, lifelong, sometimes they're fleeting struggles. But it's that moment of impulsivity, of identifying that things have to change. They have to change right now. Um, that's our moment where we can make the greatest impact. The fourth piece that we need to consider when we're looking at means restriction is availability. And some means of suicide are just available on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's the, the um, self-injury with some sort of tool or being involved in an automobile accident, causing an accident. Um, medications are, are very available across the board. Um, hanging and suffocation uh, doesn't take a, much more than perhaps maybe in an extension cord or, or a men's tie um, to complete that act. Um, tall structures, um, any urban community is, is rich with different structures that someone may choose to jump off of. Um, and firearms. Um, here in the state of Missouri, we have a, a strong number of people who um, are very protective of their right to bear arms, and um, many people have firearms in their homes. So again, we can't overlook the availability, how easy it is to, for someone to access any one of these um, methods uh, for suicide. If we take that piece of information, the availability and partner it up with lethality, it gives us the opportunity to look at attempts as well as deaths. And we're get, beginning to build a picture where we're starting to see that it's making greater and greater sense to invest our time in identifying the most lethal methods for suicide and trying to determine what are strategies that we can put in place to create greater safety. So we can see that suicide attempts predominantly are made with poison, or with cutting or piercing. And that only 1% of suicide attempts um, are uh, completed with a firearm. So that tells us that um, it's unlikely for a suicide attempt with a firearm to um, not be end in, in, end in death. When we look at the graph to the right side, we see that the death, 60% of suicide deaths, again, um, as we mentioned earlier, um, are attributed to firearms, 17% suffocation, and then the balance to poisoning, cutting, and piercing. And that tells us that um, putting our efforts where the result is death is going to be a better investment of time and energy than trying to minimize access to um, cutting tools or access to high structures, access to automobile cars, um, keys. So um, just again, a way to look at that data in a different manner. The other piece that I want to just touch on, it has to do with self-harm and fatalities. Um, self-harm is, is a phenomenon that we are beginning to see more and more frequently and is becoming more closely associated with thoughts of suicide. 
The piece that we want to uh, be clear on is when you compare self-injury or self-harm to use of firearms, you can see that there's a reverse relationship. That when someone is utilizing a firearm in their attempt to die by suicide, it's almost 85 to 90 percent lethal, ending in death. Um, and a very limited percentage of that population gets emergency department care. Now when you compare that to self-harm, um, cutting or poisoning, you can see that really only one to two, perhaps three percent of poisonings that are intended for suicide result in death, where the balance over 98 percent result in some sort of treatment in an emergency department or some other facility. So focusing a lot of attention on minimizing self-harm is not going to give us the results um, that we might need um, compared to firearms. The second part of the CALM training is what's called an introduction to firearms. And what has been identified is that people in caregiving fields, um, social work, counseling, therapists, aren't always um, as well versed in firearms. Um, it's something that they're not um, typically involved with. And so this program takes about 20 minutes to just spend some time focusing on firearms, um, what the different pieces of the firearm um, are called, and what firearms look like when they're loaded and unloaded. Um, research tells us that we're more likely to have a difficult conversation if we have some familiarity with the topic. Much as we've learned in the study of suicide prevention, the more we know about the suicidal ind individual, the more comfortable we are asking those difficult questions. So if we're concerned about someone making an attempt at their life, and we're concerned that they might be utilizing a firearm, the more comfortable we are with that tool, the easier that conversation will be for us. Um, most firearms, there are, there are many different types of firearms, pistols and um, automatic and semi-automatic and uh, long guns, um, but they all have these same common characteristics. So when we look at availability of a firearm, it's um, perceived in some communities as a suicide promoter, if you will. Um, there have definitely been correlations made between um, suicide rates and um, the number of people that own firearms, so that um, the relationship is, it's, it's a greater likelihood that someone that owns a firearm who's struggling with a difficult um, emotional um, or mental health concern, if they have that excess, they might use it. Um, the next piece that we want to look at is um, case control studies show greater prevalence of guns and less securely stored guns in homes of those who's suicide than in control. So what this tells us is that there are more suicides in homes with guns than without guns. Again, that sort of pairs back to that first point. Um, the National Violent Death Reporting Survey tells us that 85% of the youth who die by suicide do so by using a firearm. And that directly relates back to the previous um, graph that we were, took a look at. And the last piece that's really in, important is we, we frequently um, underestimate the access to lethal means as well as the thought process that someone who's struggling with suicide might take. It's easier for us to, to miss warning signs or to dismiss them as they're not that sort of person or they would never do that to themselves or to simply avoid that concern because it's difficult for us to come to terms with. So we can never underestimate someone's access uh, to identifying a lethal means. The third step in, in the CALM training is negotiation of means restriction. And this is where we talk about the different strategies that can minimize access, the different things that we can do as practitioners and caregivers to uh, begin planting those seeds with our clients that we're concerned about, that, that we are concerned for their life, that we feel that suicide may be something that's on their mind, and that we want to have that conversation with them. So we're going to want to be able to express our concern directly to the person. This is going to be on a one-on-one -on -one situation. Definitely going to follow through and ask what are their plans for suicide? How far along have those plans gone? And in what capacity does the individual who's struggling with thoughts of suicide see themselves following through on those plans? 
Um, and we also want to focus on access of lethal means of any type. Asking someone if there's a firearm in the, in the home is not enough. We need to ask if there are medical prescriptions, if there are illicit drugs, if there is a, a sword collection perhaps, um, any sort of sar sharp objects. Do they have access to an automobile? Um, do they have access to a highway nearby that perhaps they might run into or put themselves at harm? Um, there, there are many different ways that people might consider ending their life, and, and we can't just focus on one. The next step in the program has to do with um, different ways to re actually reduce that lethal means. Um, how available is it? Is it in their home? Do they have it in their handbag? Is it in the car? Do they have to get it? Do they have to go to the store? Do they have to purchase it? Do they have to go back home? Um, how sure is that individual that we're concerned about for being at risk to suicide, how sure are they that they actually can get a lethal means, whatever it might be? The next step in the strategy to help to reduce lethal means is to incorporate other people in that individual's life, um, family members, uh, friends, coworkers and help them understand how important access to lethal means is. And that when we talk about restricting access to lethal means, we're talking about enhancing the safety for and around the person that we're concerned about who may be struggling with or thinking of, of suicide. The last piece in the CALM um, uh, workshop with regard to strategies in reducing lethal means has to do with safety planning. What are the things that can be done right now to increase safety in the short term and what are the steps that need to be taken in the long term to be sure that that safety is ongoing? Um, the different things that need to be accomplished, um, what type of supervision is going to be necessary, and how important it is to encourage uh, not only treatment but follow-up treatment. And these are all um, pieces that are discussed in the CALM workshop. Um, so one of the things that is um, important to know or important to look back and reflect upon is what are our experiences with regard to success in um, reducing lethal means? And CALM does a very good job of identifying um, measurable and um, pretty obvious, actually, examples of successful means restriction. And, and just a few that uh, we talk about in the training have to do with automobile exhaust. Um, it wasn't so long ago, the, the 1940s and 50s, where um, automobile exhaust was a, a leading cause of suicide in the United States and in Australia. And um, a lot of that had to do with um, sort of that transition of the number of people that had automobiles and um, how they were storing their automobiles. So automobiles went from being parked in the street or out in the barn to being parked in a carport to being parked in an enclosed garage, which increases um, the, the possibility of capturing that exhaust um, to utilize that as a, a method for suicide. Um, the automobile indus industry um, in the 60s and 70s um, switched their technology to utilize catalytic converters. So it makes it less likely that exhaust from an automobile will result in death. Um, it's a longer period of time, so again, there's an opportunity for in intervention from other people. Um, there's a case study about natural gas in Great Britain. We've all heard the phrase, things were going so badly I was going to stick my head in the oven. Um, and there were a number of people that were doing that and doing that with a great deal of frequency. And um, what happened in Great Britain is they made a conscious effort to change the chemical um, complex of the natural gas that was being utilized and to put in some safety factors that made the, the gas itself less deathly and less toxic. Again, allowing a greater time for, for someone to be found if perhaps they were trying to end their life by utilizing the natural gas. Um, so that was a, another um, story that we talk about uh, in CALM. Other examples have to do with pesticide poisoning. Um, there were a number of uh, deaths in Central Asia uh, directly related to pesticides. And steps were put in place for safer storage of pesticides. And they noticed that there was a drop in, in the suicides in that population. Um, there's a bridge in Toronto called the uh, Prince Edward Viaduct, and it's uh, second only to the Golden Gate Bridge with regard to suicides. And in the uh, 19, 
uh, excuse me, in uh, 2003, um, some barriers were installed that prevented people from utilizing that bridge as a method for suicide. Since 2003, the last 10 years, there have been no suicides from the Prince Edward Viaduct. So again, another example of success of installing barriers that enhance safety of the environment and dissuade someone who's struggling with thoughts of suicide of jumping. Um, one of the most interesting one has to do with firearms, means restriction. The Israeli army uh, did a study and um, recognized that many of their uh, troops were uh, taking their firearms, their weaponry, home with them, um, leaving their base, going home for the weekend. And um, a great number of suicides were occurring during the weekend. And so they put in place a procedure, a policy, that uh, did not allow troops to take their firearms home with them. So weekend uh, suicides dramatically decreased. Weekday uh, suicides uh, didn't decrease at the same rate, but they too decreased as well when people were getting help and were being able to um, access services and resources. Um, the second half of the Calm workshop is really the hands-on piece of it, that the um, examples where we can see uh, by viewing a video uh, a uh, family working with a therapist and the therapist is conducting a firearms assessment and, and, and talking about access to lethal means uh, with uh, a young person and with that young person's parents. Um, we spend some, uh, I would like to say, a, a good deal of time, 30 to 45 minutes, um, looking at case studies of uh, what were some opportunities that could have been taken uh, within a given situation to do some, some um, calm counseling, um, what, how could outcomes have changed? And, you know, depending on the participants and how engaged they are, how willing they are to participate, role play is critical. Um, the best way to add a new tool to your toolbox is to practice it and to practice it with, with others that are learning at the same time you are. So role play is something that, that we really incorporate and feel strongly is an integral piece of the calm workshop. We always allow time for questions and answers, um, any sort of discussion. And then through the Missouri Institute of Mental Health, we are conducting an evaluation of CALM. So there is an evaluation component that's involved in it as well. So that's the overview of, of the CALM workshop, the different elements that are involved in it. Um, the state of Missouri has um, adopted an initiative to make CALM trainings available across the state through the Suicide Prevention Resource Centers that are strategically placed um, in five uh, general regions of the state. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Kansas City area, uh, excuse me, in the, middle, in the mid-state area, um, uh, Columbia and uh, uh, Mexico and Jeff City, the Family Counseling Center Incorporated um, provides CALM trainings. Uh, the Kansas City area, first call, uh, is providing calm workshops here in the greater St. Louis metro area. Uh, KUTO, my organization, is providing calm workshops. Uh, Pathways um, in southern Missouri is uh, providing. And then Ozark Center uh, in the Joplin area is providing workshops. These workshops are free of charge. They are um, very flexible. They can be conducted at your site. Um, whatever capacity is going to best meet the needs that you have. Um, if you're outside of the state of Missouri, you can contact um, Elaine Frank directly, and I'm, I'm positive that she can connect you with someone that could provide a calm workshop for your staff or for your community. And this is her um, contact information. Um, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center also offers an online training with regard to CALM as well, so that might be a resource to look into as well. The Missouri Department of Mental Health has a, a wonderful website that lists resources, contact information, fact sheets. It, um, it talks about um, different funding opportunities for suicide prevention work. It lists upcoming events across the state. Um, keeps the uh, stakeholders aware of the different activities that are going on within their regions and within their um, suicide prevention resource centers. And also um, collaborates with other divisions within the, the department um, to, uh, to promote activities that enhance mental health and emotional wellness and can really go hand in hand in helping to prevent um, suicide as well as other um, life-threatening um, circumstances. 
Um, at the national level, some of the key resources that are available online, the American Association of Suicidology, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, uh, Means Matters through the Harvard Injury Control Research Center um, has a really great program called Means Matters um, that is available and is easily utilized um, across the lifespan to help people become more familiar with, with how important it is to identify lethal means. Uh, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, we've mentioned them already. And then SAMHSA's Resource Center to promote acceptance, dignity, and social inclusion associated with mental health. Um, all really great resources um, to help connect people of all walks of life to the different resources that are available to them. Um, again, I appreciate you being here and participating in this overview of Calm Counseling on Access to Lethal Means. Um, I hope I've been able to give you some meaningful information about what the program is, what the program isn't, and how you can get access to it. And perhaps um, created some interest for um, adding this to your in-service training or professional development for your staff or constituents. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, Tom, if there are. Um, the first one, actually, I think you you did cover. You might have to back up a little bit on okay. the slides because somebody asks if if uh, the trainings could be provided to agencies out of state, and I think you gave the uh, contact information right, right there. Uh, so the folks, the people that are asking about that, uh, if you can't read it, you can also pull the uh, slide up in the PDF file, and it provides Elaine Frank's contact information, gives her phone number and email address, as well as a website on that slide. If there are any further questions, please uh, feel free to use the chat window at this time. You talked about MIMH helping with an evaluation of it. I don't know how long that's been going on. Is, are you seeing anything from that evaluation yet? Um, well, it, it's really in its infancy. We just started rolling that uh, evaluation piece out, I would say, uh, winter, um, November. October, November, and so it's still in the process of collecting that information. But um, just you know, sort of word on the street and feedback from participants that that have been in the Calm workshops has been really um, positive, um, very accepting that um, this is a an overlooked component in their practice, and appreciative of the simplicity of Calm, and that it's it's not um, an overwhelming process to help I someone uh, create greater safety um, f uh, for themselves as an um, individual struggling with thoughts of suicide or for family members um, who are concerned about someone in their, in their life. How does the, the training itself, does it vary based on the audience that it's being, being tra taught to? Um, you know, to some extent, uh, there, there's the core pieces that I went over this afternoon, and it can certainly be um, grown to be a more rust, robust piece. Um, th there are some early slides that are being developed with the QPR Institute to incorporate that suicide prevention piece into a COM, so it becomes a, 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 st a stronger component. Um, COM is not intended to be a standalone suicide prevention piece. It's really intended to complement and to go to that next level of uh, prevention and identification. All right, well, I don't see any other questions rolling in right now. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for being with us one more time. Thank you folks for joining us today. Reminder that Elizabeth will be a part of our Spring Training Institute. We also do an annual program on suicide prevention in conjunction with the Department of Mental Health and a program that, that goes on there. Uh, the dates have not been posted yet, but there will be information on the website. It looks like it's going to be coming up at the end of June this year. So stay tuned to that. We'll make sure that you and your colleagues are on our email list so that you can get the latest information regarding that and our other programming activities. Also, a lot more web conferences coming up. Keep, keep your eye on our website for that as well, and we'll keep you posted by email on that. CEU is still available, and we'll send you the link to the CEU application in a follow-up email in case you missed it on the screen today. Otherwise, we'll say thank you folks for joining us today. And Elizabeth, thank you again. Thank you very much, Tom.